Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer and my guest this week is Rupert Spira. And I had the pleasure of meeting Rupert and his lovely wife and his brother Andrew out at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California a couple of weeks ago. Thanks again to generous donors that made that possible for me. Um, and I'm really pleased to be speaking with Rupert. I very much enjoyed your presentations at the conference and I'm really enjoying reading your book um, the transparency of things. I understand you have a more recent book. And what I like about your book is that as I read it, I'm actually reading each little section. It's each, it's, it consists of very short paragraphs, usually one or two sentences. And I find I, I tend to read each one two or three times and kind of settle down with each reading. And it's almost like a meditation practice or a mantra or something. I settle down with each reading and until it's sort of settled into the heart or uh, and has become clear to me and then I go on to the next one so and I, after you know 15 minutes of reading I just feel like it's it's kind of shifted my awareness somewhat which I imagine was your intention in it, in writing it, the book <laughs> it, exactly that's exactly how I hoped it would be read it's not a, a book for reading cover to cover as you say it was written almost one sentence to a paragraph very, it's a very contemplative process of reading, and I, I hoped that people would read it exactly as you're reading it. One or two sentences, long pause, allow it to, as you say, to, to go into the heart, mm -hmm. and then... Yeah, and I am reading it cover to cover, but I'm taking my time and just sort of, you know, <laughs> sometimes just 10 or 15 minutes of reading, and then I go to sleep for the night or something, but it's, uh, Perfect. it's very enjoyable, and I, I'm really... Um, it raises a lot of interesting questions, uh, but it's um, been very enjoyable to read. Um, so why don't we start by having you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and all, because some people might not be familiar with you at all. I know, I know you that by profession you're a ceramic artist, but um, why don't you fill in that information a bit before we continue? Well, I, I was a ceramic artist until I started speaking full-time about non-duality. There's now... Uh, um, N not enough hours in the day to do both. Oh, so great. in fact, now over the last year or so, I've almost completely stopped making bowls and and speaking or traveling pretty well full time now. Oh, I envy you. Maybe I'll evolve in that direction. <laughs> I'd ra much rather be doing this full time than what I do. <laughs> uh, and okay, so you were a ceramic artist, and um, I understand that Francis Lucille was your teacher, but uh, that. Unlike me, who was a kind of a wild kid back in the 60s, taking full advantage of everything the 60s had to offer, you spent your teenage years and, and thereafter um, probing into this stuff, you know, reading and thinking and meditating and whatnot. Yes, from about my mid-teens onward, I was th th this, th th the, uh, the nature of reality, for want of a better phrase, um, was really my my uh, oh, not not my only interest, but but really my main the main focus of my interest, mm -hmm. and um, I started going to a, a school of classical Advaita Vedanta in in London, mm -hmm. where I spent uh, much of the next twenty years. I learned to meditate there. There was a formal I, school, or just meetings? It, it was, no, it was, it was a formal school um, that had originally been started by the Russian philosopher P. D. Uspensky. Mm -hmm. And um, but had subsequently moved on and was now um, under the guidance of the of the, uh, of the then Shankaracharya of the north of India. So I, I I really spent twenty years um, re really uh, um, studying practicing the the classical Advaita Vedanta mm. teachings. And at the same time, I also learnt um, the Mevlevi turning the the, the whirling. Dervishes. I practice Gurdjieff, mm -hmm. the Sufi practice. I I learned Gurdjieff's movements, and but but uh, my main focus all, all this time was the um, Advaita teaching, as it was uh, taught in a classical Indian format through the Shankaracharya. Mm -hmm. And really, I spent um, twenty years or so there. It was the main focus of my interest all during those years, from roughly the age of fifteen to. 35. Mm. Um, so you had a meditation after, practice of some sort? So I do? meditated twice a day, mm -hmm. uh, um, mantra meditation, mm -hmm. I went to study groups. Uh, um, it was really the, 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 the main focus of my life, uh, 
quite intensely for those 20 or so years before I met my teacher, Francis Lucille. Mm. I was a student of Maharshi Mahesh Yogi for many years, and his master okay. was, was the previous Shankaracharya of the North. That's right. The, the, the Shankaracharya. Who, Saraswati. The, the, that's it. Um, Brahmananda Sar, um, Shantananda Saraswati mm -hmm. was the teacher, uh, I, was my teacher in India for those 20 years. Yeah. And he and the Maharishi shared a teacher, Guru Deva. Right. So th it, it was a, a similar, a, a very similar tradition. Ah, yeah. It came from the same, the same source. Interesting. So we're, we're cousins. <laughs> cousins. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Um, okay. And so then did you and, meet and, Fred? And that oh, sorry, gave me, to, sorry, just to, th just to um, elaborate on that. that. That really prepared the ground. It was, it was like 20 years of, of uh, preparation. Mm-hmm. I'm and glad to hear you say uh, that because a lot of people they they do something like that and then after 20 30 years they have an awakening and then they go they turn around and they say to everybody oh you don't need to do anything you know even though <laughs> even though they've been doing it for 30 years yes th th that was a a preparation mm -hmm. um for me for for um what happened next which was the meeting um with Francis who who I immediately recognized as my teacher and my friend and and teacher and in fact, that meeting, in a way, it made sense of my past. I had got to a stage at the uh, School of Advaita Vedanta where I felt that I couldn't go any further. I knew that there was something that was still missing, something that, that I hadn't really managed to make the teaching my own. I loved it deeply. It was the focus of my, my interest and love and attention. But there was something that was still missing, and I knew this. Mm. Um, so it, it, it prepared me then for, for, for meeting Francis. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was when you were thirty five. How old are you now? Thirty six, actually. I'm now fifty one. Okay. Um, was Francis in France at the time, or was he in uh, in California? I actually met him for the first time in my home in the West Midlands, but he was living in Northern California. Yeah. And and during the subsequent years, I I spent a lot of time with him in Northern California, mm -hmm. before he moved south where he is now. Okay. And what was it about Francis that? made you realize that he was your teacher was there just a, was it sort of an intuitive thing more than anything he said yes it's i i couldn't put it down to any one thing that he that he did or, or said it was just a in, in our very first meeting it was just a, a simple unmistakable knowing ah oh, that this is what I've been prepared for. This is what I've been looking for. An affinity. It, it, it wasn't, yes, but it wasn't about a person. Right. Although I, I had an, have a, a close relationship, a close friendship with Francis. It wasn't about a person. It was, it was something much deeper than that. Mm. Just an unmistakable, it was like a recognition. Ah, <clears throat> I, I, the way I formulated it to myself at the time is, ah, I've come home. Ah, nice. <clears throat> don't, don't ask me exactly what I meant by that because home was not a place or a person. It it wasn't even a teaching. Mm -hmm. Somehow there was just this unmistakable recognition. Oh, that's it. I'm home. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, and as you began uh, studying with Francis or whatever the word may be, um, what was the nature of it was was it basically a sat song arrangement where Francis would talk and you would listen but uh, or or what the the teaching takes place on many different levels that the 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 top layer we could say is is teaching mm -hmm. formal teaching questions and answers that the um, the teacher either giving a discourse or answering questions so that's in a way one layer of the teaching but there's also a um there was a deeper layer, which was a more a, a kind of contemplative exploration mm -hmm. of my experience, which, to begin with, he, he he guided me in, and later on I would find my own ways, inspired by the ways that he had shared with me, I would find my own ways of exploring my own experience. So this was like a, a deeper layer mm -hmm. of the teaching, more contemplative, less verbal, more contemplative, and in particular in particular involving not just the exploration of the beliefs 
in separation, but more importantly, the, the feelings of separation in the body. Hmm. And that was an exploration that really is not undertaken at the level of words or conversations. So this was something that had been missing in my previous teaching, and I realized it had been mis missing. So these the first few years I spent with him, he really opened opened the door to this much deeper level of the investigation of the level of the body. And then the third aspect of, of the teaching was really just being together. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes just being together, sitting in silence, as we did often, or, or sometimes just, you know, going shopping together or cooking or right. having casual conversations. So uh, I, I elaborate on that because I want to, to make it clear that the, the teaching in words, the questions and answers, um, it would be simplistic to reduce, I'm not suggesting for a minute you are, but to reduce the, reduce the Advaita teaching to, to a kind of an exchange of information or even a conversation. It, it was right from the beginning, it was very much more than that. Uh, yeah, I would agree. It's it's a multi-layered thing, and and the, yes. the words are just the tip of the iceberg. And you exactly, know, there's so much more going on. <laughs> Ex exactly. Yeah, um, there's an energetic thing going on, but but even more, even below the energetic thing, there's a there's a kind of sharing of presence or or, or silence, which is e e even deeper than the than the energetic exchange, let alone the verbal exchange. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say perhaps that there's a kind of a, an attunement that takes place when you can be yes. in the proximity of of a teacher exactly. like that. that it's, it's a kind of resonance. Yeah, it's like the you know, you know get a piece of iron near a magnet and it it, it eventually becomes a magnet itself. You know, you could use yes. various, various allegories or you know like a, a a piece of wood near a burning piece. The the second yeah. piece ignites after a while just because of yeah. the yeah. yeah. Um, this exploration of feeling in the body, feelings in the body, was it um, a deliberate practice where you would like sit in a meditative way and sort of explore what's going on, or was it sort of something you did 24 hours a day when you were awake, you know, just kind of, or both? It, it, um, both in a way, but I wouldn't say that it was, even in the more, in its more formal aspect, I would never say that it was a practice. It wasn't like here are a set of things that you can do and now you go away and practice them on your cushion it was never never like that the the, the explorations were always just made up in the moment they were just spontaneous ways of exploring the feeling of being located in and as a body so to call them a practice would somehow suggest some kind of mechanical element that you as a separate entity can undertake in order to achieve some kind of an outcome it wasn't like that at all they were they were uh, very um, sensitive and loving contemplations mm -hmm. of of the body, and in particular of the sense of I am this this limited located self. So it started out as this um, in a slightly formal way, these very loving explorations or contemplations of the body. But then these just extended into everyday life. So it, in the end the difference between when I was exploring this with my teacher and when I was just out in everyday life exploring it, that, that difference fairly quickly faded away. And I would just find myself walking down the street whenever there was spare um, attention or I wasn't focused on any particular um, task. This loving contemplation or exploration of, of the body, and, and not just of the body, but, but of the world, of, of my perceptions, mm -hmm. would just take place. So it, it just it was just the air I breathed. It was what I loved doing and what I was interested in. And it just t took place naturally at, at all sorts of different times of the, of the day and, and the night. Mm -hmm. So it became second nature after a while. It, it was second nature, yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this, for all the years that I was in the classical Advaita school, this exploration of truth or reality or whatever we want to call it or, or, or oneself, it was second nature anyway. It was what I was doing mm -hmm. pretty well 24-7 anyway. But this took that exploration n out of my mind. Right. It, to it took it, in other words, it took it out of my thoughts and it brought it down into my sensations, into my body. And not just into my body, but out into my perceptions of the world. So it was an exploration that included the sense of separation in the body and the feeling of the world being outside, separate, distant, and, and, and other. Hmm. 
Was that Francis's specific um, recommendation that you do that, or did it just somehow no, no, ar no. arise because of he, your... He had no recommendations. He, okay. he, he had no prescriptions, no recommendations, no agendas. He would just respond to conversations and questions, and if if I asked a question about something, then he would respond to, to the question. But there were no... There were no uh, recommendations per se. It was just part of the deepening exploration of my experience that, that he led me into. Can you give us a specific example of, um, hope, hopefully this won't be too uh, crass to try to narrow it down to a specific example, but you know, if you can think back to when you were doing this, um, and maybe you still are doing it a, a little bit, but um, let's say you're walking down the street, for instance, and um, try to put us inside your ex the the, me the mechanics of this um, experience or this process that you've just been referring to uh, in a way that people listening could relate to and perhaps even uh, begin to do themselves. Let, let's take an example. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll give you a, a a real a real life example. In fact, it was almost the very first time this happened for me. I was um, sitting in in um, with Francis in his home in Northern California then, and we were having a conversation about non-duality, and and I don't remember exactly what it was. And I remember at the time hearing a dog barking, and it was a, a distant sound of a dog and immediately a thought came up that's the sound of a dog barking and the dog is in the distance on, on the other side of the valley so uh, somehow this was relevant to the context of the conversation and, and I said to him but it, it's so obvious to me that that dog is on the other side of the valley it's so obvious that, that the sound is taking it, it, it's at a distance from myself and it's made out of something other than myself it, it's a dog barking, it's not me and I remember at the time I, I, would, I must have been sitting on the floor he, he said um, place your hands on the carpet mm -hmm. so I just went like this and actually I shut my eyes mm -hmm. I remember and, and he said place your hands on the carpet and I placed my hands on the carpet, and then he just said, where does that sensation take place? And it was just so obvious at that moment that the sensation took place inside me, that the sensation was not at a distance from me, it wasn't made out of something other than myself. All that was present was the experience of sensing, mm -hmm. and sensing takes place in me, not, not in me, a body, and a mind, but in this open, empty, aware presence. It, and, and if I look in, inside that experience of sensing and f find out what is there, what is it made of, awareness is the only substance present there for it to be made of. It just became so clear experientially. It was experiential before it was rationalized. Mm -hmm. It was just so obvious that this sensation was taking place inside me, so to speak, and not, not only inside me, but made out of myself. So this, ex and that was the end of it. That was the end of the conversation. But this, it was like a key. Suddenly, I, I, and I reasoned with myself, if this is true of what I thought was this carpet, this dead, inert material called the carpet, it must be true of everything. So then I would, wherever I went, I'd go out on the streets and I'd be looking at cars and people and houses. And, and I realized all I know of these these so-called cars and people and houses is the experience of seeing and hearing where does seeing take place does it take place 10 meters away from myself or 2 meters or 20 meters when I look at the moon all I know of the moon is the experience of seeing does it take place at a million miles from myself or is it intimate close made only out of myself it, it just became so obvious that wherever I looked Wherever I turned, all I knew was the experience of experiencing. That was all I ever know is experiencing. And, and all experiencing is pervaded by the knowing of it. And I am that knowingness, that awareness. It pervades all experience intimately. 
so it just became clear to me at a very experiential level long before I was able to rationalize it in the way I'm doing now that all that is ever known is experience and I the knowing element in all experience pervade all experience intimately in fact that even that is not true because I'm suggesting that there are two things what one called experience and another called myself and that they somehow pervade each other it's not even that all there is all we know is the knowing of our experience and that is what I am that is what I awareness is this this pure knowingness which is the substance of all experience now someone might argue well you know that doesn't mean that the dog is within yourself or anything or that you and the dog are the, are the same thing uh, you know the dog is two miles away and your you know your awareness which is created by your brain <laughs> is uh, you know and, and is functioning through the sense of hearing and just you know sound vibrations are coming uh, you know fluctuations in air pressure hitting your eardrum and so on and that's giving the experience of the dog and and if you were deaf you wouldn't hear the dog but somebody else in the room might hear the dog so that you know it's uh, not within you it's just I mean I'm just kind of alluding to the way people ordinarily experience and understand the yes. world you know yes so what you're starting with is is a conventional model right that first of all there is time and space mm -hmm. the world that appears in time and space a body is born in the world a mind appears inside the body and eventually a little fragile spark of consciousness or awareness appears within the mind and created as you say by the brain mm -hmm. that that's the conventional model and yep. the objection that you raised is based on that model however there is absolutely no evidence for that model at all because what you're starting with is the absolute reality of time and space in the world and saying that I, this little fragile awareness appears at some point in, in inside this world inside this body but it's just simply not our experience our experience was that awareness was there first when I say was there first I'm making a concession when I say that to the belief in in the reality of time what I really mean is awareness is here now but but in order to translate it um, to, to, to respond to your question let's just say awareness was there first that is our that is the primal experience so we have a belief that time and space were here first then the world then the body then the mind and eventually awareness was created by the brain but it's never been experienced the experience is always that awareness was there first that the world appears in awareness the body appears in awareness our thoughts appear in awareness and the only substance present in awareness out of which they are, can be made is awareness itself we can dance around this question for as long as we like but in the end if we're going to use experience as the measure of truth we have to acknowledge that ex awareness is here first mm. before the world not 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 before in time but right um, prior to the experience of the world. Yeah. exactly well i would do a pretty poor job trying to continue to play devil's advocate for the, material, <laughs> for the materialist position because I don't share it. <laughs> In fact, you know, I, I agree with you sort of intuitively and, and experientially, uh, but it's interesting to play with it. Um, how about this one? Let's say out at the conference, um, there were maybe 500 people in the room when you spoke, and um, we all, you know, presuming our eyesight was functioning normally, saw, um, you know, someone that we could describe as Rupert Spira. We didn't see a pink elephant on the stage or a, uh, uh, you know, a pine tree or something like that. W there was a sort of a, sh a commonality in our mutual experience. So that sort of points to the idea that there's a, there's a sort of an ob objectivity to reality that is independent of individual observers. Um, you know what I'm getting at? And, and how, would you how would you respond to that point? I, I would agree there is a commonality to experience mm -hmm. but it's not the outside world it is awareness that we share not the outside world but because the mind has no knowledge of awareness it can't see it it can't know it the mind and I'm caricaturing the mind here 
the mind says, as it were, yes, th that there is um, a continuity to my experience. What can this continuity be a result of? So it looks around for something to explain the apparent continuity of experience. And the only place the mind can look is to objects. Well, the mind is obviously not continuous. The body is, in the mind's view, fairly continuous. And the world is obviously the continuous element as far as the mind is concerned. So, so the, 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 the mind conceives of this permanent world, permanent time and space. But it's only because the mind cannot, cannot know or cannot see awareness. In fact, the world is not shared in our experience. Everyone's experience of the world is private. It's yes, private, but, but, but there's but, a commonality. But, but, the, but there's a common. So what is what is common it, it, in our experience of the world? It is awareness. Yeah, well, that well is, we that, all that, have awareness. That is the only. It, it's the only thing we share. But because the mind cannot see awareness, it overlooks the presence of awareness, and it attributes the apparent commonality or continu continuity to the world. So it's just because the mind knows nothing of awareness. What is truly shared, what is truly continuous in our experience, is not a world or a body or a mind. It's awareness. No, I agree with that. Um, and awareness is sort of the, the ultimate common denominator among us all. Um, but what I was getting at is that in addition to that commonality, there, there seems to be a sort of... Um, uh, an agreed upon so called objective reality uh, we don 't yes. all we don 't all completely fabricate a different world if we did it wouldn 't be possible for us to function <laughs> or in uh, as human beings or as a society or anything there's there seems to be an obje uh, objective structure that um, is agreed upon unless we 're you know psychotic or hallucinatory or something and, okay you okay know. so consider this Rick imagine you have a dream uh huh and um, you invite 12 people for dinner. They all uh -huh. sit around the table, and in the middle of the table, there is a vase of flowers. Mm -hmm. Each person that you've invited for dinner describes the vase of flowers. They're all, the descriptions are all slightly different because they're all looking for a, from a different point of view. In a dream, but, this is in a dream. In a dream, but, okay. but everyone's description is similar enough mm -hmm. to make everyone in the dream feel that they're perceiving the same vase of flowers. Mm -hmm. Now, you wake up. What is it that accounts for the similarity of everyone's description? Your own dream. Yes, I mean, because, because it was only one mind that was having the dream, yes? Uh -huh. Now, what about if exactly the same thing I is true in the waking state? Twelve people are sitting around a table, or in this case, 500 people in a room, Everyone describes not, not an identical but a similar picture, and this is enough to convince everyone that there is a, an, a real, independently existing outside world, or, which each of them is getting a, a slightly different view of. Could it not be that what is, it, what is common, what gives everyone the, the, the sense that, that there is a commonality to their experience is because just like the dream, there is one thing in common. Each of the 12 uh, people staying for dinner, they're all born out of the same mind. Mm -hmm. What about if these 500 views of, of Rupert sitting on the stage are all born out of the same consciousness, mm -hmm. all born out of the same awareness? And it's precisely because they come from and therefore express the same awareness that there is a commonality of view. When the mind then tries to account for that commonality because it can't see awareness, it attributes permanence, commonality, to the object. But it's a misplaced, it's, it's projecting the only true, the, 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 the reality of our experience. It's, it's projecting it onto an object only because the mind cannot see the true reality of our experience, which is awareness. So you're saying that not only is awareness um, kind of a, a common substratum for us all, but that, uh, that 
on a, in a more manifest way, there is a sort of a universal mind which gives rise to an agreed upon environment. And I'm not suggesting the environment is non-changing. Of course, obviously, it's always changing. But it, but there's a, there's an, a, a sort of an agreed upon structure to it. You know, we all see the red light and we stop our cars. You know, <laughs> it doesn't. It's not subject to uh, interpretation unless there's something wrong with our our perceptual apparatus. But but you know. You're having a dream. Everyone arrives at the traffic light. Everyone in the dream stops at the red light. That doesn't that doesn't tell us anything about the nature of the mind in which the dream is taking place. Mm -hmm. So if if we look to objective phenomena to try and ascertain something about awareness, we're we're never going to we're never going to find out about awareness. There's only one place to find out about awareness, and that is in awareness itself. Yeah. No, so, I'm, I'm not saying that, though. I'm not suggesting that we look to objective phenomena to find out about awareness. I'm just saying that the, the, the universal, universality extends beyond the unmanifest. It seems that there's a universality to the relative itself, which um, enables us all to live in a, uh, an agreed-upon apparent reality that doesn't sure. fluctuate according to the vagaries of individual, you know, individuality. At a relative level, that's certainly true. That's, yes. I find that interesting. Yes, it sort of um, implies a, a an intelligence that structures the world that is far vaster than uh, our individual expressions of intelligence. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yes. it's maybe it's an irrelevant point to you. I don't know, but for some reason, I just felt to pursue it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I tell yeah, you why why I don't um, get intrigued with that. I don't get intrigued because this is you know it, they're interesting ideas, Rick, to play around with, mm -hmm. and and to try to try to make models of reality that account for an intersubjective agreement. But you know, at, at very best, at best, these arguments are going to be convincing intellectually. That that's at best. Yeah. In most cases, they're not convincing intellectually. There's always a loophole. And, you know, I don't want to discuss ideas with you, Rick. Sure. I want to... Let's talk about experience. Okay. So something... I don't want to theorize because, you know, to be honest, I don't have any any hard and fast theories about the way the physical world is. You know, the, the answer is I don't really know Good why enough. the physical world is where it is. And I don't really know. And, you know, I'm not really... In a way, I'm not really interested. I don't think that a, a human mind, if, if we can call it a human mind, can ever truly understand the laws that, 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 that govern the, the, the universe. At, at best, it would be intellectual speculation. And it's just not, I, I'm not putting that down. There's nothing wrong with it. But yeah. it's not what I'm interested in. Yeah, you don't feel it's germane to realization. Yeah. No, no. I, I think the think reason I, I brought it up was just that, you know, there was a sense in what you were saying that each of us creates the world, uh, you know, through our, our own subjectivity. And uh, I was that sort of made me feel like, well, but yeah, but no. there seems to, seems to be something that is not dependent on our subjectivity that maintains yes. a, a structure to the world. I, I hope I didn't imply, Rick, that I think that each of us creates the world. The, the, all I know of the world is perception. Mm hmm that that's all I know of the world: sights, sounds, tastes, textures, and smells. That right. that's it. Now, these, in my experience, they just appear in myself. Mm -hmm. When I say myself here, I refer to to this aware presence that I know myself to be. These sights and sounds, they, they just appear in this in this presence. They're never separate from it, never at a distance from it. And when I explore my experience to see for myself what these sights and sounds and tastes and textures and smells are made out of. The only substance I find present in my experience is the knowing of them. In other words, it is this knowingness which, or awareness that is the substance, the, the reality of my experience. That doesn't mean that experience doesn't appear as, as a car, a house, a tree, a moon, a person. Of course, all those appearances they, they continue, but when I explore and see what is the reality, what are these appearances really made of, all I find is the intimacy of my own being. Mm -hmm. that, that's all I can say. So I don't want to speculate about an apparently objective world because I've never experienced an objective world. Mm. All I've experienced is as a perception 
appearing in awareness. In fact, even that model is not quite right because I'm suggesting that awareness is like a big open empty space and, and a perception appears in it. It's not like that. It's more like a, a, a screen. Of course, even this metaphor is not right, but it's more like a screen. It's not that the perception appears on the screen. It, it is the screen. The screen is the only thing there. <laughs> when you go up and touch the landscape, the trees and the flowers and the hills and the fields. You don't touch trees and flowers and hills and fields. You never find them. You just find the screen. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in my experience. Yes, of course, my experience seems to comprise a computer, a camera, a lamp, a room, etc. But when I go intimately, lovingly to the heart of that experience, first of all, what I find is seeing, hearing, touching. And then when I ask, again, in my experience, not intellectually, but when I ask, what is seeing made of? What is its reality? What is its substance? When I go up to it and touch it, all I find there is the knowing of it. And, and when I say all I find there, who is the one that finds that? That, that one is, an aware, is, is aware or knowing. So it is knowing that finds itself. It is awareness that is aware of itself. That's all my experience consists of. Awareness, knowing itself, being itself, in all this apparent multiplicity and diversity of experience. But it's only a multiplicity and diversity of experience from the point of view of one of the apparently diverse objects. In other words, from the point of view of a separate self. From awareness's point of view, it's not a multiplicity and diversity of everything. It's just itself everywhere. Wherever it looks, all it finds, all it knows, all it loves is itself. The self, our self. This very self present now that is seeing and hearing. Beautiful. Um, in your own experience, um, since you like to refer to your own experience, and I think that's wise, um, presumably you started out many years ago, like all of us, uh, perceiving things from the perspective of the isolated individual, you know, sure, sure. and and now apparently things have shifted to the uh, you know perspective of awareness. Um, is that a predominant perspective or is it exclusive? I mean, in, in other words, is there still a balance between uh, you know universal perspective, seeing everything as and in awareness? Uh, and s having the sort of individual perspective along with it, or um, and is there a ratio that can, that tends to go back and forth like a seesaw, or is that an absurd way to speak? I mean, is it just all the other pole of of the spectrum now? No, that's not not an absurd way to speak at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that occasionally old habits of thinking and feeling. And, and as a result, acting and relating on behalf of a separate inside self continue to appear. The, these are, are old habits that still have a little bit of juice left in them and that are occasionally triggered, apparently, by a, a situation or an event. So I, um, I would never say never. Uh -huh. These are These are... The, the the old habits of thinking and feeling on behalf of a separate self we we never know when they're going to pop up again and and they they continue to pop up from time to time and isn't a certain um a certain modicum of a certain bit of separate self necessary Marshi used to use the term lesha vidya faint remains of ignorance and he used to say you need a, a bit of that in order to actually function as a human being he, he the Vedantic analogy he uses is if you take a butter ball and you're holding it in your hand and then you throw it off, there's still some greasy surface on, on your palm. And that without um, some remnant, at least, of sense of individuality, you wouldn't, be there, there would, you wouldn't be able to function in the world. Do you agree with that? that or? That's not my experience. In okay. fact, it's, it's the presence of the imaginary separate self mm -hmm. that, that causes dysfunctional behavior and relationships in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, 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 the belief and feeling of separation serves absolutely no practical purposes at all. It, 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 ha it has one function in life, and that is to create unhappiness. It's all, all it does for us. It's possible to leave a perfectly sane, ordinary, 
healthy, active, engaged life with a family, at work, you know, just a, a regular life without any sense of being a separate self. And, and indeed, without ever mentioning or speaking of non-duality. Mm -hmm. that, that point always puzzles me because I'm, you know, having had my own spiritual practice for decades, I'm very comfortable and settled in a, a state of presence and so on, but I, I still experience a sense of separate self. And uh, in addition to, the, to, the, to that, which is not a separate self, the two somehow go hand in hand and they get along very comfortably together. I mean, if I were to say to you, you know, Rupert, run down to the bank and take out all your money and send it to me, or if the police were to call and say, uh, you know, Mr. Spiro, your son has been hit by a car, it seems to me that there would naturally be a, a sort of an individual reaction to uh, yes, things but, but like that. Yes, but you see, of course there would in both those occasions, but... In, in both those situations, but you're equating um, individuality with ignorance. You're equating individuality with an expression of the belief and feeling of separation. Uh -huh. I, I I wouldn't make that uh, that 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 distinct. I, I wouldn't d define it in that way. W w when the body mind is relieved of the belief and feeling of separation, in other words, when the imaginary self ceases to live in here the thinker the feeler the chooser the decider or, or in here the feeler the lover the when the body mind is then liberated of, of a tremendous burden mm. and as a result that body mind then flourishes it doesn't necessarily become a, a whitewashed wall without any character without any individuality on the contrary it's the belief in separation that crushes true individuality real individuality flourishes in the absence of a sense of separation, that the, the, the true character, the individual, it, it, it flowers, it blossoms when it's relieved of, of the cramp of being a separate, limited self. Mm -hmm. and, and how that individuality expresses itself varies hugely from body mind to body mind. In one, um, it, it, there, there may be an explosion of creativity and extroversion and going out into the world in one form or another. In another, they may just go home quietly and live on their own or maybe have a family and just work in the community or, or whatever. All, all ev These two extremes plus everything in between mm -hmm. are, are possible. So it, it's... The, this, this, that's what I would call individuality, um, individual, undivided, an expression of the undivided whole at the level of the body mind, mm -hmm. and and it's not that kind of individuality, that kind of uniqueness is not an expression of the separate self. On the contrary, it flourishes when the separate self is seen to be non-existent. Hmm. Interesting. So, to uh, just to dwell on this a little bit more, if you don't mind. Um, I had a, I mean, I'm not the big flashy experience kind of guy. I've, I've had, you know, many little breakthroughs and a few big ones. And there was one particular big one back in the 80s where it actually happened during sleep. And I woke up feeling like I'd been released from a straitjacket that I'd been in all my life. And there was complete freedom and um, independence of sense of separate self, as you say, although there was still a, an individual body mind which got up and went about its day. And I don't think that I've ever returned to that sort of constraint since then that I once lived in. Um, but I, I still have a, a sense of personhood, you know. I mean, if somebody, obviously, if somebody comes into the room and says, hey, Rick, I turned my head. Uh, <laughs> my, sure. my wife says, "Take out the garbage." I know who she's talking to. Sure. So, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes when you hear about oneness, you kind of get the sense of, you know, uh, an amorphous ocean of of uh, sameness, you know. Um, but, I mean, you know, the ocean is the ocean, and it has many, many waves, but it's still just one ocean, and yet each wave has its distinct expression. So I suppose what you're saying is one, one no longer considers oneself merely to be the wave. One realizes one is the ocean, but expressing as a particular wave, which is nonetheless one with the ocean. Would that be a fair way of putting it? it or am yes. I getting too, uh, too wordy here? No, you, you could put it like that. Okay. 
One, uh, you see, go ahead. I, sorry, no. just just to elaborate on on that. Yes, please, Rick. Um, all, all these examples that you give, turning your head when your wife calls your name, the, these kind of things, uh, the, these these are just practical responses of a body mind of a character to a situation. There's no ignorance. When I and when I say ignorance, I, I don't mean this critically. I, I just mean it in a sense of ignoring the reality of our experience. Th th these kind of responses are not a sign that the separate self is still in place. Mm -hmm. I think what happened for many people that uh, had to go to India for enlightenment, uh, um, because, because these people, and I, I started for 20 years going to India, so and, and that was a tremendous um, disadvantage to me in some ways because I never really saw non-duality for real in, in everyday experience. It was always packaged in the rather exotic culture of India. I could never really see, live alongside, see how, how in my case, that the Shankaracharya related. You know, what did he talk about when he had his meals? How did he treat his kids? All, all this kind of thing. You know, he was just a flowing white beard and, and an orange robe, and no, no, no disrespect at all. He, he was part of his culture, but but he he, he was a, a kind of or Ramana Maharshi was another example. You know, I, I modelled myself on Ramana Maharshi for twenty years and failed spectacularly because all I knew of him was this beautiful, smiling, um, almost silent being and I thought okay that if you want to be self-realized you have to be like that and of course because the only time I ever saw him was in my imagination and one or two photographs I never lived 24 7 and really saw what it was like this understanding in real life and and even if I had been with him in India it would have been uh, he was conditioned at one level by his Indian upbringing so th so for this reason I think many people who went primarily or solely to India for enlightenment have a, still have some uh, residue of a notion that somehow a awakening or enlightenment or I, I don't like using these words because they're so laden with exotic experiences but somehow that this it just it kind of wipes the character clean and 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 that you can no longer you, you can no longer you can barely function i mean i was at a meeting recently somebody even suggested that when i put on a, a sweater it, in the cold weather it was somehow a resistance to the current situation and and it therefore was a sign that i was a separate self and then i asked him well what about when i eat is, is that you know that, that that you could say that was a resistance to 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 the feeling of hunger and therefore an expression of ignorance and he said well yes i do think that i mean these these crazy notions and uh, th these kind of ideas make enlightenment something impossible f to ever realize something that you have to be super hu human how could i with all my all my faults all my character all my how could i ever realize what these people are talking about because you have to be this bland whitewashed perfect creature and and this just projects enlightenment further and further and further away in the distance when actually it the, the teaching should make it seem closer and closer and closer and easier and easier and easier because real enlightenment is not it's not an exotic experience it's the natural condition of all experience it's the most familiar thing we know just the knowing of our own being as it is which and it shines at the heart of all experience it's always present it's the best known thing if we can call it a thing that, that we know it's a great point and I think it's you know I'm glad you said it I think that a lot of people need to hear that I, I in my own town where I live uh, there are you know thousands of people who've been meditating for decades there's a university here where John Hagelin is from and and so on and um, John Hagelin's a fellow who spoke at the conference we both attended and um, you know there's definitely this notion that enlightenment is something off the charts special and and you know, even flashy, and you know, Marshi himself had a sort of a charismatic personality and a certain way of speaking and a lot of presence and darshan you know, and all. And people think, well, that's enlightenment. Me, I'm just a chump. You know, how could I possibly? Know, I think the, these kind of uh, um, and, and I'm not now 
referring to the characters in any way that you've mentioned, but these kind of ideas that enlightenment is somehow exotic and far away. They, uh, it's India that is exotic and far away. It yeah. is not enlightenment. Enlightenment and India have nothing to do with each other. No, India I agree. is truly yeah. exotic, but yeah. enlightenment is not exotic. The knowing of our own being, the knowing of the light, which truly illumines all experience, is the most familiar, the most natural, the, the most easily recognizable thing in our experience. And by, by allying enlightenment to, to an exotic culture or an exotic experience, it, it puts it at a distance, and by putting an enlightenment at a distance over there, you just crystallize the sense of a separate self in here mm -hmm. that then has to meditate and work hard for 30 years. So these kind of beliefs, they just perpetuate the separate self. And the separate self, the, the more it tries to achieve enlightenment, the more it strengthens itself. In fact, one of the best ways the separate self perpetuates itself is by trying to get rid of itself, trying to attain enlightenment. And this is why people complain. I, I hear this so often in my meetings. I've been doing this for, for 30 years, and, and I've been trying, and, and, and that's very, very genuine. I myself did this for 20 years, but I didn't notice that subtly the separate self was perpetuating itself, trying to get rid of itself in favor of an exotic experience that was projected way out there in the future, and if possible, had an Indian or Tibetan label attached to it. Yeah, I I uh, seem to recall that the the Nazis, um, you know, complained that that relativity theory was Jewish, <laughs> and uh, and then of course it might be argued that gravity is British, you know, since Sir Isaac Newton kind of came to understand it. So I, I totally agree with you. I mean, enlightenment is not an Indian thing. I would even say it's a human thing. I mean, who of knows? There, there may be species it, on other planets who are enjoying enlightenment who are not human. No, but there's only one thing. It, enlightenment is not something that, that a human species or any other species enjoys. Enlightenment it, it's the is essential nature a, of things. awareness recognizing itself. Of course, right. ultimately, awareness never ceases to know or recognize itself. So even that's not quite true. But the, the only one that enjoys enlightenment is awareness. It's not a human achievement. It's not an alien achievement. It's not an animal achievement. Enlightenment is the only one, sorry, awareness is the only one that is aware of anything. And, and enlightenment is, is awareness just being relieved of, of, of the apparent veil which says that enlightenment is not present, that light is not present. This is, it's interesting. I, you, I sent you an email just about half an hour before we started. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but it was sent to me by someone who knew I was going to interview you. And it's, it's a long thing. It's about a page long. But the distillation of his question... I didn't question, see it. Uh, he wanted I, me I to didn't see it, right? Okay, he wanted me to ask you, and it pertains to what you're just saying. That, um, and this, maybe this is a metaphysical speculation. You don't want to go there. But he wanted to ask if it seems that there is anything gained by the whole rigmarole of creation having had to somehow manifest and come about and you know life forms evolving who could eventually sort of realize through through the instrumentality of our human nervous system the that from which they came you know to to quote that T.S. Eliot quote we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time he said his question was is is there anything that has somehow more than what we started what what was there to begin with before the whole you know creation manifested is is that uh, too uh, metaphysical for you to no it, it it's not but it depends what what we refer from whose point of view are we going to consider this from the point of view of awareness if we can consider awareness having a point of view, or from the point of view of the separate self. From the point of view of the separate self, yes, there is a meaning, there is a purpose, there is a destiny, there is something to be discovered, there is something to be achieved. So yes, all that from the point of view of the separate self, there is a purpose to evolution. But from the point of view of awareness, which is the only real point of view, it is already everything it could ever be. There's no becoming. There's nothing for it to find or know. Wherever it looks, all it finds is more of itself. Mm -hmm. So no, from the point of view of awareness, there's no 
There's no purpose, there's no destiny, there's no meaning. It is already that for which all apparent selves are destined. So it's the, 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 there's only a purpose or a meaning for a separate self, but the separate self is only a real self from the illusory point of view of that separate self. In other words, you imagine a, a, a film, there's a character in a film. The, 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 the character, and there are lots of people in the film, all the people are real from the point of view of, of, of the main character. Everything in the film that appears is real in relation to the point of view of the main character. But that character itself doesn't have a real point of view. It's in the view. It's only made of the screen. The separate self is, is not a real character with a real point of view. It's just an object appearing in the view. So, sorry. That's no, it's okay. No, I, uh, um, well, I guess the, the question is... In, in other words, uh, the, yeah, the, the, entire, the entire adventure of, in, uh, of, uh, of forgetting our true nature and then remembering or realizing our true nature. The whole thing takes place in a little bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that little bubble is just like a, a, a tiny little thought and feeling bubble taking place in awareness. It seems very important for the one that is inside that bubble. <laughs> but the one that is inside that bubble is a re only a real someone from the illusory point of view of, of, of that one inside the bubble. For, 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 for awareness, which is the, the only one that really knows or is aware, it, it's, it's not going anywhere. It's not becoming anything. It is already that for which all seeming things are destined. Agreed. Now, but when you say, well, awareness becomes aware of itself, or everywhere yeah. it looks, it sees itself, that, that sort of statement, um, that implies some sort of um, mechanism of knowing okay. or seeing, okay. you know, as, as if okay. there were awareness had little senses. Yeah. In, no, no, but, but you, you, you must allow me the limitations of language. Uh, awareness doesn't, doesn't go around looking and seeing itself everywhere. It, it, right. you, it, this is just the limitations of language. I, I didn't mean to suggest what, what you are, uh, are now uh, I implying that somehow awareness go goes out looking for itself and seeing itself everywhere. I'm just using language casually and caricaturing awareness. Of course, uh, uh, awareness doesn't go around looking for itself or seeing itself everywhere. It is already knowing itself. It never ceases to know itself or be itself. It's only, it's only a, a, a thought or a thought and a feeling that rises up in awareness and made only of awareness that seems to make it that, that makes it seem as if awareness is not knowing itself like an image that rises up on a screen that makes it seem that the screen is veiled and that what we are seeing is a landscape we think I'm no longer seeing the screen I'm seeing the landscape it's like that in fact when we're seeing the landscape we're never really seeing a landscape. We're always, always, always only seeing the screen. Likewise, from awareness's point of view, which is the only real point of view, it is always, always, always only knowing itself. But, but a thought arises made only of awareness, which seems to veil awareness, like this image seems to veil the screen. And from the point of view of this thought, it seems that awareness is veiled and, and, and this thought made self now has to go out and do lots of things in order to find awareness again. But awareness is, it, it's, it's like a, the, common, the common metaphor of a, a wave seeking water. That is what the separate self is doing. It is made out of the very stuff for which it is in search. Mm -hmm. So there is no true veiling of awareness, just as there is even the darkest horror movie never truly veils your TV screen. So the darkest mood or depression or thought never truly veils awareness. Awareness is only veiled from the point of view of the imaginary entity, which is itself made out of the very stuff, the awareness, which it apparently veils. In other words, there is no real ignorance. This is why in India, they don't have a word for ignorance. They refer to the illusion of ignorance. If yeah. there was such a thing as ignorance, then we would have a, a problem on our hands. We would have to sit on our cushion for 30 years to get rid of it. 
but ignorance is is only ignorance from the point of view of ignorance it's not real from awareness's point of view which is the only point of view there is no ignorance the word what can maya we do about i'm saying the word maya comes about, from a, oh i'm sorry go ahead you, you no, continue all i was going to say is what can we do about non-existent ignorance yeah what is there to be done about it just to see that it is non-existent right the the rope was never a snake the rope was never a snake. <laughs> um, the, and the word Maya itself actually comes from a couple of roots, meaning which not, it, that which is not. So it's, it's not like Maya is, has any substance to it. it. It actually is not. Well, no, Maya does have a substance to it, but it's just as the, the landscape in your movie has a substance to it, but right. it's not grass and trees and mountains. When you go up to it, we don't find mountains. We find screen. Right, the landscape right. has it, it it's an illusion as a landscape but it's real as the screen mm -hmm. maya is an illusion as objects selves entities but 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 the illusion has a reality to it its reality is awareness mm -hmm. i guess maybe what this guy was getting at in his question is you know why could not why could awareness not have been content to just remain in, you, in you, itself, you know, uh, without all see, this fuss of a universe, and it almost see, seems like something is is gained through the through the no. whole manifestation, where it, it can become a living reality. There can be Rupert and Rick here actually talking about this, as opposed to flat, unmanifest awareness. Yeah, you see, with that very question, Rick, we create the duality about which we then, for which we then seek a cause. Why is there all this duality? There isn't. There is, no, there is no duality. So with the question, why all this palaver of a creation? Why all this du mm -hmm. duality? Why wouldn't awareness just be happy sitting at home content? <laughs> awareness <laughs> is happy sitting at home content. <laughs> That's what awareness does 24-7. It just sits at home content. Why is there duality? With that very question, right there, du the duality for which we are seeking a cause is created with that thought. So why duality? Because you asked the question, huh. there is no duality. There is no real duality. No. From, from whose point of view is there duality? There is there is duality from the imaginary point of view of a separate self. From awareness's point of view, which is the only real point of view, there is no separation. Nothing is distant. Nothing is separate. Nothing is other. Nothing is not made out of itself. You know that from your Advaita studies, you may know the word mithya, which means dependent reality, where the example given is of a pot, you know, and you being a ceramic artist should appreciate this, where, you know, we have this pot and it appears that it has functions. You can put water in it, you can put beans in it, you can use it as a drum. But when you get right down to it, it's nothing but clay. There, there is no pot, there's only clay. So, you know, there's this sort of concept of the, the sort of practical reality and a concession to concession to duality for the sake of functionality and, and living life, but with the understanding that it actually is nothing other than awareness. But again, Rick, you're suggesting that in order to lead a practical life, you have to make a concession to duality. It's not necessary. You can lead a perfectly normal, functioning, practical life without any sense of separation. You bring up a family, go to work, run a household. The, 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 these things, in other words, practical everyday life, doesn't imply you don't need a separate self. All the separate self does for us in everyday life is create conflict and dysfunction. It's not necessary. You can you can do, do the shopping, go to the grocers, go, bring up a family. All of these things without a sense of separation or duality. You're, you're making in enlightenment sound so impossible if you place it at odds with regular functioning life. Then it would be impossible. I mean, what would we do? Or we'll go and live in caves for, for the rest of our lives if we wanted to? No, no, I'm not suggesting that. I, I, I'm not suggesting this implies anything to do with recluse life or, you know, or not functioning in the world or, or anything like that. Uh, I'm just sort of playing with the conundrum of the apparent world, the apparent reality, um, and you know, giving 
giving a certain amount of credence to that in order to actually function. You know, this is, this is my wife, this is my son, this is this person I don't even know. And, and yet at the same time, not failing to appreciate the, the, the basic you know, truth of the yes. situation. Yes, no, but but do do you not think that it's and of course, Rick, I I, I know that I, I know you realize this that that it's that it's possible to do all that to refer to my wife and my child and to, and to do all these things because these are the conventions of of language, but all all, all we can use language in in this way in this very ordinary conventional way and go about an ordinary more or less conventional life and at the same time know that the reality of all of this experience is is made out of our own self. Absolutely. I don't, uh, yeah. the, the, no, the, the potter the, says, no, this is my pot, this is my bowl, this is my exactly. cup, this is my ashtray, but he knows that they're all clay. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Good. Um, one thing that I found intriguing about your book is that um, more so than most people I read or listen to, you uh, draw a distinction between stages of experience or stages of development in which initially one may realize uh, oneself as awareness that I am that, uh, but not yet realize that all this is that, and yes. that in, in perhaps in time or maybe you don't want to say time, but eventually or at some point somehow um, one recognizes, oh, all this is the same stuff as that which I have known myself to be. And yes. I found it intriguing that you drew that distinction. Um, Maharishi used to talk that way also. Perhaps it's our Shankaracharya background that this is coming from. I don't know. But maybe you could uh, um, touch upon that a little bit. Yes, I, I, I do make a distinction. Uh, but it, that doesn't mean to say that everybody has to go in this way. It, right. th this, this experiential understanding can, can take place in, in so many different ways. So it's just a... A, a broad um, distinction that I make, and, and it's basically this: that normally we think that uh, I am something. In other words, I, I, what I am is this body and mind, and it is I, this body and mind, that sees objects and others and the world. Mm -hmm. And that, for many of us, not for all of us, but for many of us, the first stage to realizing that this is not actually true of our experience is to realize no it's I awareness that is aware of the body mind and world it is not I the body and mind that is aware of the world it is I awareness that is aware of the body mind world so th this this is a, a a realization that what I am is a, essentially the, the the aware presence that knows the body mind and the world mm -hmm. so and and then so previously, I thought that I was something. I now realize that I am not something, not a thing. In other words, nothing. I am nothing. By that I mean nothing perceivable, nothing objective. I'm not a body. I'm not a thought. I'm not a feeling. I'm not a memory, a perception, an image. I am not a thing or I am nothing. And this is the traditional neti neti. I, I'm not this. I'm not this. I'm not this. I'm that which knows all this, that the path of we could call it the path of exclusion. Um, and we arrive at, I am this empty, open presence of awareness. Now, if we, if we explore, if we stay there, we don't have to stay there because it's what we always are already. But if, if we explore what is our experience of, of this awareness, which means what is awareness's experience of itself because we've now realized that what we are is this awareness from awareness's point of view instead of the imaginary point of view of a body mind but what is awareness in my experience what is awareness's experience of itself we find that it has no experience of any limit in itself it has no experience of itself ever having appeared or disappeared in other words it has no experience of its own birth or death it, it never disappears, it's ever-present, it has no finite qualities or, or limitations. So we realize in this way that what we are, or awareness, so to speak, realizes, of course it always knows this about itself, that, that, that it is ever-present and without limits or infinite. So th this realization that I am this ever-present, unlimited awareness is what is sometimes called awakening that the, the knowing of our own being as it truly is un 
apparently veiled by the beliefs and feelings of separation. But then the, it's still, a, and, and this is sometimes called the, uh, the witnessing, witnessing right. po position. It, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's a halfway stage, we could say, because it's still a position of duality. Right. It's, it's a much subtler duality. There is still awareness here, myself, and all these objects of the body-mind. Now, what is the relationship between my self-awareness and these objects that I now apparently witness, the body, mind, and world? And as we explore the relationship between these two, we find, in fact, that they are not two. All we know of the mind is the experience of thinking and imagining. All we know of the body is sensing. All we know of the world is perceiving. And if we look deeply into the experience of thinking, sensing, and perceiving, we, we find, first of all, that there's no distance between myself and the experience of thinking, sensing, and perceiving. But more than that, we don't even find two substances there. If we go to the experience of thinking, whatever it is that knows thinking is not separate from the thinking. It's just one substance. It's not divided into a thinker and a thought. Sensing isn't divided into one part that senses and another part that is sensed. Seeing isn't divided into one part that sees and one part that is seen. It's one seamless substance. And the stuff that it is made out of is the knowing of it, which is awareness. So this, this we could call, if we call the first part, the path of exclusion, this is more like a path of inclusion. When this, having realized that I am this nothing, this no-thingness, this open, empty presence, we realize that that is the substance of all apparent things. So we move, first of all, from I am nothing to, from I am something to I am nothing. But then this next step we take, we move from this nothingness that I am is the substance of everything. I, in other words, I am everything. So the, these, sometimes I, I would, I would make the, the distinction between these two positions. First of all, I am something, the path of the, the position of ignorance, which simply means the ignoring of the reality of our experience, and we move from there to the path of understanding or wisdom. I, I, am, I am empty, unlimited, ever-present awareness. And from there to the, path, to the position of, of love, where, where I know myself as everything. And in fact, even that is quite, not quite right, because there, there, are no longer, there is no longer everything. There are no longer things. It's not that I am all I am everything there are simply no longer things left for me to be the totality of there is just myself just awareness knowing itself being itself and that is the substance of all experience all experience shines with that with the light of awareness alone I understand perfectly well what you're saying and um, and I've been able to talk this way for a long, long time, but I'm not sure that I experience it with the same degree of clarity that that you apparently do. If if I hold up this cup, you know, I understand the, the whole explanation you gave in terms of you know, you know, this particular or any any particular object, uh, but I don't uh, see my I don't see the cup as awareness there's there's not the the same kind okay. of unity that i um infer from from what you explain okay, as so there just appears to be in your from your perspective but rick just look at your cup now mm -hmm, sure yeah okay so now you're looking at it and touching it that's perfect so both these the sight of it mm -hmm. and, and the touch of it seem to seem to um validate the belief that there is an external object called a cup made out of something other than awareness. Mm -hmm. So let's take both of these two in turn. First of all, the, the, the sight of the cup. Your, your only knowledge of the cup when you're looking at it is the experience of seeing. Right. Is that true? Correct. Now, where does seeing take place? How close to you? Well, infinitely close. I mean, right... It, closer than know. close. Yeah, right. Yeah, as close it, as... It, it, the question doesn't make sense, yes, because it's... It, it, it is you, yeah? What, what, what yeah. is... 
Okay, so having discovered that it's, it's not taking through, place in the cup, it's yeah. It, yeah, but but there isn't. We've we've already discovered there isn't a cup. There is just the experience of seeing. Mm -hmm. Now, now, if you were to, in your imagination, Rick, if you were to reach into the to the experience of seeing, and try to touch in your actual experience, try to touch the the substance out of which seeing is made. What do you find there? Ah, uh, it's well. It's, I, maybe it's the limitations of language, but it's not something which can be touched. Cause exactly. That, that implies so, a... Perfect, a, yeah. perfect. So there's nothing solid there. But if you had to find a word, it's obviously made of something because the experience of seeing is real. But So there must be something in inverted Yeah, if you had there. to use, you what, what use would a word you like it? consciousness, awareness... You know. it, it's, it's just made of the knowing of it. Yeah. Yes? N okay, and now the mind objects and says, okay, that may be so for seeing, but what about when I hold the cup? Well, any of the any of the senses, it's okay, the same, okay. same situation. Okay. So now, now, now you hold it. So your mm -hmm. your, the, your second form of knowledge about the cup is the experience of touching. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where does touching take place? Again How close in, to yourself? A, again, in awareness. Yes. And and what is if you were to reach in and try to touch the substance that touching was made of? What would what do you find there? Um, you know that. I am that substance. It's not something that can step Perfect. apart from itself and Perfect. say, "Okay, A is touching B." <laughs> and why, why do you tell me then that you that you don't experience that everything is made out of awareness with the same clarity that I do? Because you've just demonstrated that that is your experience. Well, you never I, know anything other than this, than the knowingness out of which experience is made. Somehow, I'm not. Um, Getting it. I'm not. It's like I've had tastes like that where some. I'll, like when I was in the shop buying apples one day and I, I was looking at the apples and all of a sudden I was really seeing myself <laughs> while looking at the apples. Okay. Or one time my wife ran the blender in the other room and, and it was like. It was me, that sound. There was, okay. there was a, a sense of self, but it's not like my 24 7 daily okay. experience. So look around yourself now, Rick, and, and mm -hmm. can, can you tell us? Can you point to something in your experience that is at a distance from yourself or made out of something other than yourself? Well, it's all perceived by virtue of awareness, and as you've been saying, and, uh, and by virtue of the mechanics of perception, my eyes, my ears, my nose. No, but now you're the, going into theory, Rick. You have no knowledge of eyes and ears and nose at, at the moment. Stay well, with your if experience. I, if I went blind or if I closed my eyes, then I'm not seeing you anymore. You, know? you still have no knowledge of your eyes at the moment. It's just a concept <laughs> that your super that thought is superimposing on your experience. So you go to your experience now, Rick. Mm -hmm. Just your experience. In other words, pretend in order to make sure that you're referring to your experience and not to memory or ideas. Just imagine that you're a newborn baby now. Mm -hmm. This is the first experience you have ever had. You've right. never had a prior experience. This is all you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have no knowledge of eyes and. And, and ears, and, or, or, or you don't even know that you have a body. You just know the current perception. You, need, you know the experience of perceiving. Where yeah. is it taking place? Don't refer I, to memory or ideas. Well, I don't remember when I was a newborn baby, but... Um, no, but, but be like that now. Be like that now. But, but yeah. imagine, in, or, or, the only reason I say be like a newborn baby is to try to get you not to refer to the past or to an image of reality or a memory, but just to refer to your direct experience now. R referring only to your direct experience, try to point towards something now that is at a distance from yourself or made out of something other than yourself. Uh, well, um, Im visual images, physical sensations, sounds, all okay, these things are taking place. Of course, I can interpret them better than I could when I was a baby. I know that's a monitor and this is my chair and stuff, but there still is this perception going, in, perceptions going on. But we're going into interpretations. I'm not asking you to interpret your experience. I, I can interpret my experience as a, as a monitor and sounds and everything, but the raw experience itself, mm -hmm. it's just seeing. It is. Seeing, now, hearing, touching. Wh what is seeing, hearing, touching made of? Where does it take place? That takes place in conscious, it, okay. it, you know, by virtue of consciousness or in consciousness. But then and the question is, self? that which is seen, that which is heard, that which is touched, um, I don't quite get it how where, I'm seeing that as consciousness. That object? But where is that object that you're referring to? In consciousness, registering in consciousness. So when you say about the seen, the heard, the object that we see, 
Mm -hmm. the object that we hear, the object that we touch. Show us that object. Where is it? <laughs> Where do you find it? Put point now in, in, around. We can't see very much of you, but well, if, if you and I were in the same room, uh, you know, I'm no, I'm looking at things, and I could say, Rupert, here's my monitor, here's my wife, here's a water bottle, here's a cup. Don't talk about if, Rick. We're not. We're talking about this experience, not not an imaginary experience. This experience now. Point mm -hmm. to something in your experience now that is at a distance from yourself and made out of something other than yourself. Can't really do that. Um, I. C Perfect. You know, Perfect. Can you ever do that? Well, uh, let, let me qu let me qualify. I can't say that anything in my experience is there by uh, through any means other than consciousness, you know, perceiving it. Um, but I, I don't mean to be stubborn and and drag this on too long. But you know, I still don't quite get how the thing being perceived is consciousness. Consciousness is enabling the perception, but how is it that the thing being perceived is made of consciousness? I, my monitor appears to be made of plastic and metal. Because you keep going back to this idea of a thing mm -hmm. in its existing independently in its own right that is known by consciousness. Mm -hmm. it, that is true, relatively speaking, but now we're going beyond that understanding to something that is truer. Nothing we say is absolutely true, but we're going beyond this uh, this second stage, the, 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 the halfway house that we talked about, mm -hmm. where we said, yes, awareness is aware of the objects. We're going much more deeply into our experience now. Where is this separate object that you keep referring to, Th this thing which has existence in its own right? You keep saying, my monitor is made out of what? But when you go to your monitor, your only experience of this monitor is seeing and touching. Right. Is seeing made out of metal? Is it made out of something solid and dense in, in, and inert? Or is it made out of the totally alive substance of, of awareness, of knowing, of seeing? There's no dead matter there. It's made out of something that is totally alive. Pure, we could say it was just made out of experiencing. Where'd, what is this thing or object that you keep referring to. Show us an object now, Rick, that is that has an o that has its own independent reality or existence. Where do you find such an object? From my ability to know things, nothing has independent reality or existence. It it only exists in my world uh, if I perceive it. Which is not to say it doesn't exist in somebody else's world. I mean, I'm sure there are things in your room right now that you are perceiving that I'm not. That that for you have existence but they don't for me because I'm unaware of their existence there are no things in my room at the moment Rick and, and there's no uh, there's no room there's just the experience <laughs> of seeing all I'm aware of now is seeing touching and hearing mm -hmm. I don't take place inside that all that is made out of myself we could say it takes place in myself but even that's not true because I awareness and not like a big open empty space. I'm I'm dimensionless, and all this, all this seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling is made out of this dimensionless, ever present awareness that I am, hmm. and I'm trying to suggest that that's all you know of experience as well. Of course, I'm perfectly capable of conceptualizing when necessary a, an object, a room, a person, a, a chair, a, a, a screen, and, and I regularly concept, or rather thought regularly conceptualizes experience in this way when necessary. But the, the difference is that I don't believe that these concepts refer to something that is actually true. In other words, I don't really believe there are solid, independently existing objects made out of dead, inert stuff called matter. Because that's not my experience. It doesn't stop me using these concepts, but I don't believe that the concepts are true. In, in my heart, I stick to the truth of my experience, which is that everything, everything is made out of this alive, aware substance, which is myself. In other words, that everything is myself. I'm going to have to keep 
deepening in my in my clarity on that. I mean, I don't want to, um, you know, belabor it too much. On the other hand, sure. I don't want I don't yeah. want to sort of insincerely say, okay, Rupert, I've got it. You know, it's something yeah. I think I have to grow into with greater clarity and. Uh, you know, and as I say, it's like it's, I've been talking this way and understanding these concepts for ages, um, but I, I just have the sense that there is a degree of of genuineness and clarity which can which can be lived, which I am not living as fully as I might. Does that make sense? Uh, do you think yes. I'm hanging myself up by even talking that way, or does that not seem like a sincere no. observation? No, no, Rick. Not at all. I find this whole conversation is is very, very sincere, and and I've just I've just been um, kind of exploring with you the, the 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 real nature of our experience. You're you're being totally sincere all, all the way through. I, I I respect that. Yeah, no. and it's beautiful the way you do it. I mean, I'd love to sit with you every day and do this. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really great. I can see why you've shifted from being a ceramic artist to being a full-time teacher. <laughs> um, one thing that that segues from this and that I wanted to talk about is that, um, and you know, perhaps you can allude to your experience as a full-time teacher, uh, if you don't mind the word teacher, uh, and that is that. You know, people sort of you. One can speak from one's own level of experience. One one can't do anything other than that, really. And but people are hearing from their level of experience, and often there there is an apparent gulf. And sometimes it seems to me people uh, learn the words and they learn the terminology, and they mistake that terminology for the realization to which it points. And they, be, yes. they can even become very conversant with that. They can even turn around and become teachers themselves when, in fact, they've only really gotten good with the terminology and haven't realized in, f in its fullness the, the, uh, the state to which that terminology refers. Would you care to comment on that? Yes. Uh, yes. I think uh, something I've realized over the last couple of years is that teaching itself, is, it's it's really an art. It's an art form. It, it's not just a skill. and it, It's a skill, but it's more than a skill. It's an art form. And it, it requires a, a tremendous sensitivity. And I, I agree with you completely that just to, just to speak the, the, the kosher non-dual words it, it doesn't qualify one as a teacher. In fact, if one is truly coming from the experience, if we can call it an experience, or from the let's say from the experiential understanding towards which the non-dual teaching points, then it it frees us completely from any convention of teaching. Now, in response to a question that that this type of true non-dual teaching may respond with perfectly uh, kosher non-dual language but in another situation it may not the teaching may seem to condone the apparently separate self that is concealed more or less in the question it may even suggest to that separate self why don't you try doing this well, why don't you explore this why don't you investigate this now the, the, the non-dual fundamentalists will say oh no no you're just um um, promoting the sense of separation you're giving the separate self something to do therefore you're not teaching the true non-dual teaching this is, uh, I find this approach really uh, fundamentalist because there is no true non-dual teaching what, what, what the only thing that qualifies a teaching as being non-dual and that is if it comes truly from that understanding and if it does it's then completely free to use any kind of teaching skill or method, including apparently dualistic or progressive methods. And I would far rather hear a teaching that seemed to condone the sense of separation, that says to an apparently separate self, why don't you try doing this? Why don't you explore this? Maybe you could investigate that. I would far rather hear that than, than hear every single question answered with the oh there's nobody there 
there's nothing to do. Everything is made out of awareness. In other words, if, if there's a standard answer to all questions, that, to my mind, is suspect. Hmm. It, 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 may, it may not be, it may be true. I'm not suggesting that all such responses are untrue. But if we only take the absolute point of view, then, I mean, actually, if we truly take the absolute point of view, we would never open our mouths. Anyone that speaks about this, anyone that says anything about it at all, is already making a concession to apparent dualism. Just mm -hmm. by using the word awareness, we are subtly implying that there is something other than awareness. Right there, mm -hmm. we, 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 we imply duality. So having once we're speaking about this, we have to be honest enough and say, whatever we say is not quite right. So I'm just going to do my very best to tailor this love and understanding to the question and be completely free to use language in whatever way seems appropriate at that time in that, for that particular question, even if it would seem to condone the, the sense of being a separate entity. Mm. I'm not an expert on Ramana Maharshi, but as I understand it, he was, you know, quite accommodating in that respect. I mean, Absolutely. he would, he would yes. recommend or condone all sorts of things according to the individual's, yes. you know, state yes. of progress or makeup or whatever. And yes. also, I mean, if you think about it, Advaita Vedanta is only one of six systems of Indian philosophy, and uh, un, as opposed to what some commentators think, those systems were not competing, they were complementary, and they catered to people at different stages of their development. And Vedanta means end of the Veda. So, I mean, you may need to go through a bunch of stuff before you get to the end. <laughs> if you're already... Well, that's a ahead. slightly different approach for, from what's, what, what I'm sharing here, which is um, sometimes referred to as the direct path, mm -hmm. where, where we go straight to the reality of our experience, just straight away we go there. However, that doesn't imply that that, that there isn't an, an exploration of our experience, both before, or rather, uh, uh, in, enable us to, in in order to enable us to go directly to our experience. There may be some investigation, and also once the nature of our experience has become clear, there may be a further process of exploration, whether where the old residues of thinking and feeling on behalf of separation are, are, are gradually realigned with uh, uh, our new understanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, the, the direct path is very free. It, it, it's both direct, but it's, that doesn't mean to say that it always only uh, um, bats back the absolute truth. And refer, you referred to Ramana Maharshi, the different levels of we can call them levels of teaching yes he said in fact that silence was the highest teaching and one of the reasons for this is is that the highest the, the, the true non-dual understanding cannot be put in words we, we, we and if we're not willing to make a concession to language and some people aren't then then we should keep quiet <laughs> and point. nothing wrong with keeping quiet if we think okay it's impossible to say one word about this that is absolutely true, either we say, okay, I'll keep quiet, or we say, I just do my very best with these clumsy, abstract symbols called words, knowing that nothing I say is absolutely true, but nevertheless, it's true in the moment in response to that particular question. Yeah. Beautiful. You might say to those who insist that, uh, you know, any concession with with duality is is a uh, a reinforcement of it that you know and that there's no one to you know to practice anything therefore you shouldn't practice that there's also no one to eat anything therefore you know you better give that up <laughs> yes no, i i have no quarrel w with with people who uh, who on, only want to take the the absolute point of view it, it's beautiful in its yeah. own way but if you then want to speak about it then what are you going to say about yeah. it? Because as soon as we open our mouths, as I said earlier, as soon as we say awareness or presence or myself, any of these words, right there, we're implying the possibility of two things, something that is not awareness, mm -hmm. something that is not myself. So we cannot, we, we have to acknowledge this limitation of language and work within these limitations. But Rick, just to, um, what's, I'd just like to add one thing to this 
conversation about teaching. It's not really the true teaching. It doesn't just take place at, at, at the level of of the mind, at, at the, an exchange of words. It's really the words come laden with 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 their origin. They, they, they come full, permeated, saturated with the place from which they come. If they truly come from silence, if they come from experiential understanding, then somehow they deliver that. I mean, e even if you're telling someone how to how to make a cup of tea or paint a wall, it <laughs> somehow if that comes, if that's the correct response in the moment, and it comes out of love and understanding, then even that somehow will will convey at some subliminal le level will com convey the experience of non-duality or, or rather the, the experiential understanding it's Very not good. in the it's words like... it's where the words come from that is the true import of the teaching yeah it's like you were saying about Francis earlier you guys could be cooking or going shopping Absolutely. together or something but there was something being conveyed at a, at a more I mean, subtle level that yes you know, after yeah. the first two years with him and, and I've known him for 15 years or so after the first couple of years we had very, very few conversations specifically about truth. We were just spending time together talking about all, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The actual dialogue, the verbal exchange about so-called truth or reality was, was a relatively small, n not, not unimportant. It, 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 it had its place. It was very important for me, but it was a, in, the, in the total scheme of things, it was relatively small. Which brings up the whole notion of transmission, and I don't like that word because it implies taking something from point A and bringing it to point B, but uh, if we think of it more of, uh, in terms of attunement, that you yes. have the opportunity f with being with Francis all that time for an attunement. Yes. You know. Yes. I, 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 kind sorry. Of tuning, in, tuning into his wavelength, having that wavelength become your wavelength. I, exactly. Uh, it, it's yeah. more like that than a transmission. I, I, I agree yeah. with your... Yeah. 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 And just to just to loop back for a second, and then we'll wrap it up in a minute. Um, you know, I wouldn't. Would, would you agree that your your twenty years of studying Vedanta and doing meditation and everything you did was not a waste? I mean, earlier you alluded to it as preparatory, and as it seems like you appreciated the time spent doing that in preparation for meeting Francis and, and yes. so on. Yes, for, Rick, for for myself, it was absolutely necessary. Every single day of it was necessary. Nothing could have been bypassed. And for others, for some others, a, a similar kind of apparent preparation w will also be necessary. But but for others, not. It, Good. This, uh, if I can just elaborate on that ver very slightly, Please. Is, is that the, this so-called enlightenment, although actually I, I never use the word because it, like God, it's become so laden with with them um, interpretation and but th this knowing of our own being as it truly is it is is not an experience it, 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 when our, our when our being is realized as it is it's true that that um, a certain contraction of the body mind is is, is let go of is dissipated and this may send a, a wave of, of energy through the body and the mind, which in some people may be extremely colourful, in others it may be it may go almost unnoticed. But th th this wa this extraordinary wave in the body mind is really the after effect of of, of the non experience, the transparent non experience of enlightenment. But it's often mistaken for enlightenment. It's got nothing to do with enlightenment. And enlightenment itself is. is a non-event, a colourless, transparent knowingness, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's accompanied with these exotic uh, experiences. But sometimes it can be so quiet that it it goes unnoticed by the mind. At the other end of the spectrum, it can be so quiet that that uh, it, that, that it's not even noticed, and that one day the mind turns around and it may just say, "Oh, oh, that so, yes, so, yes," <laughs> and you, that your life may carry on almost seamlessly whereas yeah. for, for another person they may be walking down the road with no prior experience or interest or preparation this understanding may just fall into their lap as it were and 
you know, for the next five years, uh, uh, the, the, the rug is just totally pulled out from underneath them. They're disorientated. They can't go back to their lives. They can't go back to their relationship, to their work. Nothing makes sense anymore. So mm -hmm. both of these two are possible. And yeah. of course, everything in between. So, so to go back to your question, yes, for me, it was necessary. Mm -hmm. It may be necessary for others, maybe not. Yeah, no, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, both Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie had awakenings like that, which were not preceded by any practice and which were quite sudden and abrupt. And they basically had to sit around on the park bench for a couple of years, you know, yes. getting uh, getting oriented and integrated. Yes, uh, but it's not. But, that's the exception rather than the rule. I would yes. say. Yes, see, most people. Uh, um, the, the, they do the integration process as their approach. As they go along, yeah. As they go along, the body mind is slowly being integrated mm -hmm. with their understanding. So when this non-event called enlightenment is is realized, when 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 uh, when the knowing of our own being as it is is realized, the body mind may already be largely realigned. There may be no big deal. It may be just oh oh yes, yeah. of course. Of course, that's so obvious now. Of course, sure. I see clearly now. It may just, and then you may just go back to work the next morning. Yeah. Oh, and it, and it might have been a big deal if they had somehow magically jumped from where they had been 20 years ago to to this, you know. But it didn't happen that way. There was a 20-year process of integration and, and adjustment. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. In other words, you either do the integration before or after. It doesn't really matter which. <laughs> it, it's it's a, a body mind that has been used to serving a sense of separation for 20, 30, 40 years is, is going to be full of old contractions and tensions and all. Th those are going to be washed out of the system. It doesn't matter when. It's either going to be before or after or in most cases a bit of both. Yeah. And I just wanted to bring up the thing a minute ago about, you know, your appreciation of the practice you did do over those years, just to, because I, I see a, a trend sometimes where people hear non-duality teachers speaking and saying there is no one to do anything and you don't have to do anything. And it almost seems like it's not necessarily a universal instruction and it's sometimes used as a sort of an alibi for laziness or for you know, for not doing something when it might be appropriate for that particular individual to to do this or that. Um, it's again it's just it's not a universal instruction in my understanding that's right you you may be having a meeting and with one person there may be a question and you may may say well actually you know who who is this one that 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 wants to still the mind or or wants to who is the one that wants to do that and then to, in other words you may completely undermine any attempt to to do something with a goal of enlightenment. But then two minutes later, you may be asked another question by another person. And you may say, why don't you just stop for a minute and, and explore your experience? Just have a look. Look around you, you know, whatever. It is. And you may then suggest some kind of investigation or exploration. Or So these two answers would seem to contradict each other, but they don't contradict each other because they come from the same place. But, but but this, where they come from, is just uniquely tailored, lovingly and uniquely tailored to each question mm -hmm. and could appear to give very different answers, but they're not. It's the same love and understanding that is being refracted and, and, and tailored sensitively, lovingly to, to, to each question, to each situation. That, 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 that is the art of teaching. Yeah, oh, beautiful. I love that phrase, the art of teaching. And um, you're only 51, so I, hopefully for quite a few decades more, you will be refining that art. And um, it is constantly refined. Yeah. It, the form, the form, as as you rightly say, it, it's if it's alive, it, it's always finding new shapes, new words, new. It's always moving, changing, and, and yes, as you say, r refining itself. How about your experience itself? Here I go again. I said I was going to wrap this up, but <laughs> but uh, you know your teaching art is refining. Uh, but how about your actual subjective living of life? Do you, yes. is is there some refinement to that? that you, yes, yes. And what, Rick, I, how would I'm, you characterize that? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh -huh. that there's because so often, um, and I think this goes back to our earlier conversation about those of us that went to India that see that. That, that saw enlightenment as the kind of the end goal. Mm -hmm. In fact, what I've realized 
is that enlightenment is just the end of what what's called enlightenment or awakening to one's true nature is really it's just the end of one chapter mm. it puts the chapter called the separate me to an end it's the end of that chapter now the old habits of thinking feeling acting perceiving relating on behalf of a separate self continue for some time because we've been rehearsing them for whatever it is 30 40 50 years they have some momentum to them they keep going so these old habits are, are in the way we act the way we relate the way we perceive the way we move the way we sit the way we think the way we feel all these that the, the, the separate selfness is is gradually washed out of the system hmm. and what i'm realizing what i've realized is that there's no end to that process there's no and in the in the christian tradition it's what is it's what i think is referred to as the um transfiguration it, it's when the whole of the body mind world mechanism is is gradually permeated more and more permeated with the light of awareness it's one thing to recognize the the light of awareness and to recognize that it is ever present and without limits but it's another thing for the body to be totally saturated in it and not just the body but the world to to allow the old ways of of moving acting relating perceiving to be completely flooded by this experiential understanding and and to answer your question rick yes th that is a process that 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 carries on it's and 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 you know i hope it always carries on yeah. it's a process i don't think there can be an end i to to, to that the, the in other words in, in ignorance if we can use that phrase without it sounding pejorative when we ignore the reality of our experience what we are this this the light of awareness seems to become like a body and a mind in other words it becomes temporal local limited in understanding or in love it's the other way round the body the mind and the world become more and more and more like the light of awareness they become permeated saturated and they become more transparent more open more more loving until until our experience are not just our, our, our understanding but our actual experience of the body and the world it, it is one in which everything that the body the mind the world is saturated permeated with the light of awareness that's actually what I was trying to get at before when I was holding up my cup and we were having that interchange I, I just have this sense that everything could that there could be refinement such that yes. every, everything could be much more saturated than it is I mean and the word God comes to mind it seems that there's a I, I know that word has so many connotations but um, there's a sort of a divine intelligence that I intuit in everything and it seems to me that could become much more evident yes um, I, I think you're right Rick I think uh, after this the, 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 the realization of, of, our, of our true being in, in a way we just surrender the body and the mind and the world to this presence and, and pr it's like it's like um, you imagine a glass of water and you take a drop of milk and, and you drop the milk in the water to begin with it has its own name and its own form but but it gradually it, it the water permeates the drop of milk and the, the drop of milk loses its name and its form and after what so to begin with it becomes this kind of vaporous cloud-like form but in time even that the water so permeates the milk that it just the milk becomes water it becomes so saturated with the water that there's no trace of its name or form left it just becomes the water so that is uh, the 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 process that you're referring to which i think is a never ending process where the body and the world as well as the mind just become totally saturated with with this love with this light with this transparency mm, beautiful well, okay, now I can end. <laughs> now I feel like, ah, now we've really sort of okay. <laughs> come home here. That's very beautiful. So I've uh, really enjoyed this conversation, Rupert. I knew I would in reading your book and in meeting you a couple I of weeks ago. I have to, Thank yeah. you. And, uh, you know, 
I have a long list of people, but maybe we could do another one in a couple sure. of years, you sure, know, next course. time you write another book or have see how this, <laughs> this form is evolving. Yeah. Uh, yeah, love to, Rick. Thank we'll, you very much. We'll check Enjoyed in. it very much. Yeah, now let me just make a couple of concluding comments before you disconnect. Um, just for those listening, uh, this interview that I, I've been doing with Rupert Spira, Spira is um, one in a continuing series. I do a new one just about every week, and uh, they are all available if you go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which is an acronym for Buddha at the gas pump. And if you go there, you can also sign up for an email uh, newsletter too, that I send out once a week. Each time a new interview is put up, you, you'll be notified. Um, and there's also a little discuss discussion group that springs up around each interview. Um, in case you care to, and sometimes the author will come in and answer a question or two if someone has posed one. Also, if you are a commuter or like to listen to things, uh, you know, on an MP3 player, this is available as a podcast. And some people report that they listen while commuting or riding their horse or, or whatever. So uh, you'll see links for that uh, on the site, batgap.com. So thank you for watching. Thank you again, Rupert, very much. I really appreciate you, this conversation. And um, next week, uh, if it all goes as planned, I will be interviewing John Burney, uh, who's in California. And the week after that, Muji. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Mm -hmm.